here at the Maui Ocean Center. Uh, it's a really cool uh, interpretive space uh, on the island of Maui. And uh, they have some things that we have in other um, sort of aquatic interpretation uh, places like touch tanks and turtle pools and different animal exhibits. All that kind of cool stuff. They have a lot of, uh, uh, of course, kid-friendly and, and uh, young person-friendly um, event uh, activities like there's little play areas and stuff that are clearly aimed at, um, at little kids with you know, uh, dolphin rockers and things like that. Um, so it's even more surprising they have this fantastic exhibit space. If we walk over here and we look right off of the harbor here, uh, that's Kohalabe, the island right there. And it's actually the theme of uh, a significant chunk of this exhibit. So if you're not in here, there's one a lot of uh, uh, Hawaiian interpretation. So Kohalabe was uh, taken over by the U.S. military in the wake of Pearl Harbor and was used as a bombing range. And starting in the early 70s, a protest movement evolved uh, and folks would, would go out and, and uh, begin to protest the bombing of this uh, important island for the Hawaiian people and, um, and to protest the lack of uh, restoration, the degradation, introduction of non-native goats and uh, is located at the Pico or center of the island chain. The island is also the center of two movements that played a key role in the rejuvenation of the Hawaiian culture. 1976, the year members of the Project Kaho'olawe Ohana began a series of occupations on Kaho'olawe to stop the military from bombing the island. It's also in that same year that the Polynesian Voyaging Society prepared Hokulea for her first voyage to Tahiti. First voyage to come to do it, revolutionary, but at the very same time, you had these, uh, these extraordinary people that were willing to risk it all. Hopefully, a crew member studied for hundreds of hours trying to figure out the path they would take to Tahiti, and it was Kaho'olawe that had their answer. That moment, that in that magic way, I just thought, wow, it's in the heavens, the answer's there, it's telling us what to do. And then he ran right away and folded my mouth. Where do we study from? In Kiawa which translated means the pathway to Tahiti, is both a point on the island and a nearby ocean channel. So Latitude-wise, is at the center of the island chain, offering navigators views of the island's wind patterns and ocean channels. It's at Kiawa Ikahiki, where the navigational platform Kahua Kuhike was built to educate future wayfinders. Another significant spot is Moa Ulaiki, where navigators get a front row seat to study the stars. So these folks are interpreting not just the ecological history and the political history and the Native American history of this um, important island, but all of it together at the same time, which is really unusual in a, um, a public uh, interpretive space like this. Um, and uh, you know, interjecting that, con if you will, a controversy and the, the antagonism between different parties. So when I was here a little bit ago, uh, there was um, a, uh, one people criticizing capitalism, another group of people saying how uh, they shouldn't have kicked the Navy out, um, etc. So it's a very brave thing to come in and talk about removal of ordinance. So when, when the Navy, the, the final ruling in 1990 said that um, uh, the Navy had to, you know, obviously st stop bombing, but return it to um, Hawaiian control and also clear out the 
unexploded ordnance, and so they spent about $400 million on the first pass, um, and they had a lot of impact in doing it because they had to you know, dig up a lot of dirt and find out what's going on. So here's a great little story. Watch this. It's a story of love, loss, and healing. Did you know there are eight major Hawaiian islands located in the middle of the Pacific Ocean? Hawaii, Oahu, Kauai, Maui, Molokai, Lanai, Ni'ihau, and the smallest and most treasured island of all, Koho'olawe. Koho'olawe is the only uninhabited Hawaiian island, but it hasn't always been that way. As early as the year 480, people lived along the coastal valleys, where they fished and farmed. Today, there are many sacred places on the island. Pu'umoi Ivi, the adze quarry, where stones for important tools were mined. Many ancient petroglyphs that tell the story that the souls of the people are there too. The beloved Willy Willy tree that has survived many years of destruction still remains there today. Pu'umoa Ula Iki, the navigator's chair, where our ancestors or kapuna studied the stars and sea channels in preparation for long distance navigation. There are also several koa or fishing shrines that were built to ensure fishing would be plentiful. There are scars on Kuo'olawe as well, like a giant crater in the ground called Sailor's Hat, where the U.S. Navy used 1,500 tons of TNT in an explosive effects test, and miles and miles of deep red hardpan from years of animal overgrazing. Kuo'olawe is a physical embodiment of the Hawaiian god of the sea, Kanaloa, who took the form of the octopus to represent the island. We know Kanaloa is watching over Koho'olawe day by day, waiting for healing to come. So can you imagine what life was like on Koho'olawe over 1,000 years ago, before all the destruction began? Plants thrived on the island, sea turtles played and fed along the shores, fishermen from Maui and Lanai would sail to Koho'olawe to harvest abundant ocean resources for their families. They worked hard on the land and harvested uala, also known as sweet potato. The willy willy tree and akiaki grass were abundant. Our kapuna were very akamai. So the exhibit continues. Um, in addition to the, the historical uh, newsreels and uh, the sort of kid interpretation stuff, they also have a lot of um, uh, history about the, the military uh, uh, interactions and they have these really cool um, blown up um, newspaper articles uh, stretching from uh, the, actually, sorry, this way, I apologize, starting from the 70s um, and uh, the challenges that people had uh, to people starting to do activism to Greenpeace and uh, Native Hoyton's uh, activism of occupying the land to try to shut down bombing and to challenge the uh, status of the island as a bomb uh, a test range, bomb test range, and so forth. And so then moving on into the, the era of lawsuits, etc., and uh, to finally uh, having the Navy exit. And then the exhibit transitions to um, some of the historic uses that are being brought back and the challenge of doing um, restoration in an area heavily impacted by overgrazing, non-native species interruptions, etc. And then we, we transition into traditional Hawaiian management of the coastal zone. It's a really cool exhibit and a really neat way to sort of unite uh, past and present, to unite uh, the political challenges, the cultural challenges, and the thinking of what we do in the future and challenging coastal situations that are um, difficult for many groups to, to deal with. But this is a fantastic way to introduce the general public to these controversies and not shrink from them, but to actually embrace them and, uh, and have the discussion right out in the open. Fantastic idea for educators everywhere, coastal or not, but in particular the coastal zone, a really wonderful example here on the island of Maui.